few weeks ago um, in our staff meeting, as we do regularly, um, we take, and we just take time to pray for you. Um, we, we mark down prayer requests. We have a monthly prayer list that comes out from my assistant, Christina, who uh, gives us members to pray for, and you're on my heart regularly. But in our staff meeting in one particular week, one of our pastors made note of the fact that after the meeting, he called me and he said, Dave, we prayed for 22 different people and situations that are in crisis in our church. Uh, we had things like uh, a, a family that's a member of our church had a, their daughters suddenly passed away. A uh, young gal, young, mid, you know, young 30s. We had many health crises, uh, just things happening across our church. We had a pastor's wife that has been dealing and battling with chronic pain. We had obviously our worship leader who had a seizure. Uh, we had an upcoming danger surgery that's going to happen for one of our church members on June the 10 and 11. We had financial pressure in our church family, uh, people just battling all sorts of issues. All those things filled our prayer list. And, and since that time, it's just been adding more and more to my personal prayer list that I have for you um, as I pray for you from a job loss, uh, a new health scare for someone, and then more relational challenges that are just on the horizon. It, it was very obvious to us as your pastors that the Lord in his eternal, perfectly good wisdom and his eternally, perfectly, you know, kindness to us saw fit to take our church right now through a real hard time. And so what we decided to do is just make a little bit of a slight adjustment to our preaching schedule. And for the next three weeks, uh, I'm going to preach the next two and then Stan's going to preach on Father's Day. We're just going to talk about suffering because we want to get a perspective from God on suffering. You know, our hope really in the series is to give you some hope. We just want to give you a perspective that helps lift up your eyes to the heavens and know where your help comes from, right? That it comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth, that he has not left you, he is not, that he is near to the brokenhearted, that he will not crush a bruised reed. He cares for people and he cares for his people in particular. And so you, you know, you may be here today because church is at the baseball field and that's really cool and you think that's awesome and we're really glad that you're here. I would say it's a beautiful day, but it's not. It's gray, and we'd love to have blue skies. But this, in my opinion, is a great place to worship. Um, I did it regularly at that third base box and in that third base dugout. Maybe, maybe today you're here and you're you're just you're new to us and you're battling some of the issues I just mentioned. And and maybe you're wondering why in the world am I going through this and why would God have me go through this? Well, this sermon's going to fit you well. Uh, maybe maybe you're in a different boat. Maybe you're you're like I am right now. I mean, things are going great. You're at the top of your game. Uh, Your life is full of joy and sunshine. And this sermon is for you as well. Because in this world, the issue is not if you're going to go through trials and hardship. The issue is when. Um, One man said it best years ago when I was talking about pastoral ministry, and he said that pastoral ministry is is glory, then suffering, glory, then suffering, glory, then suffering. That's just the way life works in this Genesis 3 world that we live in. And so this sermon's for all of us. Another reason it's for all of us is because we need to have a good theology and a good understanding of how God works and why he works in trial. In the middle of suffering, it is easy to forget the God's work to us in Christ and to begin to doubt God. Suffering does not fit in the economy of a first world system. It doesn't fit into the economy of our of our lives. None of us set out with the goals in life that we want things to be hard and we want to suffer. Suffering doesn't fit into the formulaic way of doing life. You know, A plus B equals C. Uh, We think that good things happen to good people. And if we're honest with ourselves, we put ourselves in the good category. We think if we do the right thing, things will work out, work hard, get a good job, get, you know, get a college degree, get good grades, you know, marry the right person, and you're going to have a happy life. And we think if we believe in Jesus, live a moral life, pray the right prayers, have the right kind of discipline, live your life, and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And then suddenly, the trials of life hit us like a cheap shot. And things do not make sense. How do we view God and life when all hell breaks loose? What categories do we have when we pray our guts out and hard things still happen? 
I remember a moment like this for Jill and I on June 10th in 2000 when our precious baby girl Ruth was born. She'd been eight months in the womb and she was born alive. And our doctor, I remember Jill had gone in for emergency cesarean. And when they wheeled Jill out, all I heard was the nurse running down the hallway screaming to the other nurses, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. And they're talking about my baby and my wife. And when I ran into the emergency room to say, I need somebody to let me in because I'm about to break the doors down. And they finally let me in. And then the doctor just said, Dave, I know you're a praying man. All we can ask you to do is pray. What do you do when you pray your guts out and your baby still dies? What do you do? See, these are important questions. They're important questions because Christians in our culture quite literally have fumbled these questions and answers for years. Instead of having a humble reply for pain and sorrow, we've hidden behind our ignorance and we fakely smiled or we just said really dumb and stupid things. Instead of having a robust theology of God, God's work in and through trials, we've offered the world things like your best life now or a hashtag blessed theology that puts a smile on everything and it comes across as sappy and weak. The whole time the world mocks and they laugh because our formula way, way, of, way of looking at life doesn't make sense in the real world and it doesn't help on Main Street. It causes people to mistrust God on the one hand and mock him on the other. So listen, every one of us that are here today need this. We, we need to understand how does God view suffering and what should Christians be looking at when we do go through suffering? <clears throat> so with all that in mind, here's what I hope to do today. And this is in your notes. It should be on your, your outline. This is the big idea. It's kind of a, a summary of what we're going to learn today. And it's this, God uses the furnace of this life to refine us and help us glorify God in this life and the next. God uses the furnace of this life to refine us and help us glorify Jesus in this life and the next. Let's stand together. <clears throat> We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Sorry, I didn't give you the text earlier, but we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1. I think it's in your, in your notebooks. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7. And as Bob said earlier, just perfectly, we stand because this is God's word that is God breathed and we believe it's inspired and true and it will instruct us for righteousness. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your spirit. And thank you that you, by your spirit, speak through your word to us. Father, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to the wonders of Christ and your presence with us in the midst of suffering, and that you would sustain and care for and fulfill all the promises that you said you would do in these verses to your people. Thank you that you are the God of faithfulness that there is no dark shadows with you and help us to receive from your hand both good and bad because all things are resulting in the glory of Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thanks for being seated. <clears throat> now Peter wrote two letters to suffering people, and his letters really are some of the best letters for, for suffering that have ever been written, They're the best pastoral advice ever written on suffering. And so maybe if you find yourself in a moment where you're battling through some trial, I would encourage you, like I did years ago, 
to just read through First and Second Peter daily. Just make it part of your regiment. These people had, had loved ones that they had watched be brutally martyred for their faith. The Emperor Nero took pleasure in tormenting and persecuting Christians as a way of covering up his political failures. And yet, through these two letters, Pastor Peter gives these people unwavering hope in a world of, uncertain, of uncertainty. And knowing that, it's interesting how Peter begins his letter in verse 3, that he began it with worship. You can see that in verse 3. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter wanted these suffering people, he wanted their attention to be resolutely pointed to the perfectly good, perfectly wise God of the universe. And, and it's not just a general God, little g, or another one of the gods in the Roman pantheon, but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice how emphatic he is with it. He ends it with an exclamation mark. He ends it with a shouting. I mean, if you and I are texting each other and we're shouting to each other, we're using exclamation marks, right? We're, we're saying things loudly. He's singing this. He's marveling at this. And here's what I would ask you for a second. It, is this how you would write someone that you knew was suffering? Would you begin with worship? <laughs> or better yet, here's, a, here's just an evaluation you can do for yourself. Go back to March of 2020 and look at how you began your social media post when businesses were shuttering, life was being stopped, and church was being closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know how Pastor Peter would have began his letter? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you might wonder, why is Peter instructing suffering people to worship? Why is that the first thing on his agenda. Well, that's our first point in the outline, which is reasons to worship during suffering. Notice this in verses three through five. Peter's main reason is found at the, at the end of verse three. According to his mercy, God's mercy, he has caused us to be born again. So what Peter is talking about is that this reason for worship is that we are born again. He's talking about the fact that we have been born again to something. Now, to understand what he's dealing with, we need to know what the Bible even talks about, about why it's important to be born again. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are all dead in our trespasses and sins. John chapter 3 says that unless we are born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. And according to Peter, because of God's mercy, he causes us to be born again. In other words, God is the one who makes us spiritually alive. A dead person cannot raise themselves to life. So God must make us spiritually alive. God is the one who gives us new life, and we are born again. Now, in real time, in our everyday lives, here's what this looks like. You hear the gospel of Jesus, something in you says, I believe in Jesus, that he lived in my place, died in my place, and rose again from the dead. And when you put your faith or trust in Jesus to save you from your sins and the wrath of God, God did that work. It is God who caused us to hear and understand the gospel. I'm going to move back because my forecast is off like most times. Everybody see me okay here? Okay, good, because it's raining harder and my Bible's getting wet. When we trust in Christ, it is God who has caused us to be born again. It's God who has given us faith. That's what P Peter means when he says to be born again. And for Peter, this is the main reason for worship and suffering. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again. Now, since Peter is writing to suffering people, here's what Peter's doing. He's connecting being born again with suffering. So Peter isn't just taking our salvation experience and leaving it off of Main Street. No, Peter is putting it right where we live. So listen, if you're a Christian and you put your faith in Christ, here's what Peter is doing for you. He is using things to tell you, Christian, in your suffering, there's reasons to worship. 
you have been born again. And you're going to notice in the text, he gives some reasons why this is important. Notice the preposition to. He starts phrases that begin with the preposition to to tell us what we've been born again to. Notice verse 3. Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In other words, we are born again to a living hope. That's interesting when he says to a living hope. And this is opposed to dead hope. You might think, what is dead hope? Well, let me just give you an example of this. Imagine this man, Peter. Imagine what Peter did the day that Jesus died. Peter betrayed this man. He betrayed Jesus. He stood, he was asked, do you believe in the Christ? Are you, are you a follower of his? Aren't you one of his followers? And all three times he said, no, I'm not one of his. And then Peter stood at a distance as he watched the one he had seen do miracles, the one he thought was the Messiah, the one he thought was the king. He stood back as this one he followed closely for three years and he watched him die. He watched Jesus be betrayed and suffer and then die and then be put into an empty tomb. What do you think was going on in Peter's mind when he saw the one who he thought was the eternal king die? Well, I'll tell you what he had. He had dead hope. What made Peter's hope come alive? Well, Peter tells us. You're born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Imagine the joy. Imagine the relief. Imagine the amazement that went off in Peter's heart when he saw the empty tomb and eventually saw the risen king. You'll notice something interesting in the Gospels, that when they mention the resurrection of Jesus, they normally mention that Peter was the one that was there, that Peter saw and observed the empty tomb. His hope was alive because Jesus was raised from the dead. So this is Peter's point to suffering Christians. And we must listen well. We have a living hope because Jesus is alive and we've been born again to see and know that Jesus is alive. It's this living hope that Charles Spurgeon said lifts up the soul, keeps the head above water, inspires confidence, and sustains courage. See, we have reason to worship. We have reason to not worry and be afraid. We have reasons to be amazed because we've been born again to a living hope because Jesus is alive. But that's not all. Verse 4 tells us that we've been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now, another way of saying this is we've been born again to an eternal inheritance that heaven, all of heaven, is protecting for you. See, there's nothing in this life or the next that will take away your inheritance in the next. There's no tyrannical ruler. There's no disease. There's no government shutdown. There's no death that will separate us from what God has determined to give us. This means that while our lives may fade, listen, our eternal inheritance in Christ will not. While suffering may come in spades, our eternal hope is never lost because Jesus is alive. We have been born again to an eternally secure inheritance. Now you might wonder then, okay, okay, I get it. I'm born again to a living hope. I'm born again to an eternal inheritance but listen, man, this suffering is ripping me apart. I don't know if I'm going to make it to the end. I get that my inheritance is secure. I get that God is doing things and promise things, but I don't know if I'm going to make it. And maybe you're like me in some of your hard suffering moments. You've, you've had questions. You've had doubts. You've had wonders. You've had fears. You've Wonder, am I going to make it to the end? I'm struggling with all the things that I'm seeing in this world. How do I know that I will inherit what God has promised for me? Well, this is where Peter's, Peter's uh, pastoral advice hits a crescendo note in verse 5. Notice what verse 5 says. You who by God's power 
are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Christian, are you aware that right now, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your doubts, that your God is guarding you? He's guarding you like a warrior guarding those whom he loves from disaster. The God of the universe is shielding you, guarding you, protecting you to ensure that you will gain all that he has secured for you. In your notes, there's a quote by Edmund Clowney, and I want you to notice this closely. Not only is our inheritance kept safe for us, listen to this, we are kept safe for our inheritance. It would be a small comfort to know that nothing could destroy our heavenly inheritance if we could lose it at last. The wonder of our hope is that the same power of God that keeps our inheritance also keeps us. We are shielded until the great day when our salvation will be revealed, when our salvation will be revealed. See, friends, Peter provides fantastic pastoral care here. He gently lifts our heads from the turmoil of life and the real struggles that we all face and points our eyes up to see what God has done for us in Christ. But he does something else. He not only lifts our eyes, he he points us to the God in heaven who is protecting us and guarding us. He wants us to see the joy and the privilege and the amazement of being God's children so that in the midst of the storms of life, we, like children, will cling to our God and not lose sight of what he's done for us. So Christian, let me ask you this. Do you you see your eternally secure hope because of the gospel of Christ? Do you see that you've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus? Do you recognize that God is securing you and guarding you to deliver you to himself in that day? Do you see your God clinging to you even more than you're clinging to him? Are you aware of that? And listen, if you're here and you're not a Christian, we're so glad you're here. But could we plead with you to put your faith in Christ? Because the reality of it is you're going to have plenty of adversities and trials in this life, but I'll be honest with you, they will pale in comparison to what it would look like for you when you stand before God at the end of your life without Christ by your side. Suffering in this life without Christ as your Savior and your Father leaves you anchorless and hopeless. We would ask you and beg you, turn to Christ, believe in Jesus. We have hope, a living hope. We've been born again to a living hope because Jesus is alive. Now, Peter's living hope has massive influence on how we see trials and suffering. Notice this in our next point, which is refined by trials in verses six through nine. This section begins with this interesting phrase, in this you rejoice. So what Peter's referring to is what he's, what he's just written. In this great salvation, we greatly rejoice. In our secured inheritance, we greatly rejoice. In our God who is guarding us, we greatly rejoice. And what Peter does is he connects this rejoicing in salvation to our suffering. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you've been grieved by various trials. Let's put it this way. In this great salvation that you've been born again to, to a living hope, to an inheritance that is secured for you by a God who will guard you, in that you greatly rejoice, even though right now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Now, this is an intriguing statement because Peter is acknowledging that these people are going through trials. One of the dangers of the hashtag blessed theology in our culture is that we have no category for how to receive sorrow, suffering, and grief and cry our eyes out and be okay with it. We have no category for what happens when the realities of life really hit and being at the bottom of the barrel in our, in our hearts and still clinging to the hope that is secured in heaven. We just have no category for that. 
Instead, we come up out of it and we shake hands with people at church and we say, I'm fine, I'm blessed, I'm good. And we put a little glossy smile over the top of it. And yet internally, we're dying inside. What Peter does for us is he tells us it's okay to be bawling your eyes out, clinging to Christ. Peter gets into real life with these people. He's not dismissing the realness of their heartache. Trials hurt, and he says they have been grieved by them. And listen, as your pastor, by God's grace, when you go through various trials, your pastors will not enter into your hospital room or to your morning moment and just tell you, you are hashtag blessed. We will weep with you and cry with you because Pastor Peter does that with his people. This tells us that grieving is real and it's okay to feel sorrow. Wise Pastor Peter is feeling what they feel and he's connecting gospel hope to real life struggle. And notice the words, though now for a little while, See, Peter's perspective is unique. He's connecting eternal hope with what they're experiencing now in the temporal suffering of life. Recognizing our future hope secured by God's power is a lot like looking through a telescope at the right end, right? It puts suffering in its right perspective. It it gets suffering out there like one of the stars in the galaxy of your life. Right, You see exactly where it is. This is one moment that God has placed in my life for God's purposes and for God's end. But losing sight of our eternal hope is like flipping the telescope around. And suffering and trials begin to be larger than life. When we see our suffering in light of the eternity to come and in light of God's work in our lives for the gospel, our suffering becomes something that is for a little while. It comes and it goes. This is why Peter can say, though now, for a little while. Now friends, this is God's perspective on your trial. Suffering will not take away the living hope that he has secured for you. Suffering is perishable, it is defiled, and it is fading. But your salvation and your inheritance are not. Suffering is real, but it is for a little while. And this isn't a pat answer, nor is it sarcastic. Suffering, compared to the eternity of hope, will last for a little while. And listen, many of you in the audience that have a little more gray hair on your head like I do, you can look back on your life and you realize some of those sufferings were for a little while in comparison to the years that you have lived. Take that suffering and compare it to the list and the years of eternity. It is for a little while. That's one of God's perspectives on your suffering. But notice another perspective. There's another phrase that provides perspective on suffering that you can't pass over, and it's in verse 6. Peter says, if necessary. If necessary. In other words, trials only come if necessary. Now that's a stunning comment. That means if you're going through trials, it is necessary for you to go through them. But here's the question. Who determines it's necessary? Right? Who who is the one who determines that something is necessary for you to go through? Is it the devil? Because that's what Our modern theology of suffering would tell us is all suffering comes from the devil. Therefore, we need to just resist it, move on from it, because God wants us to be this happy, wealthy, wise, joyful, whatever it may be. Well, according to the Bible, we've got some challenges on our hands. The Bible tells us that according to Job, when his wonderful, crazy wife came to him after he lost everything, had boils all over his body, his health had gone crazy, and his wife comes to him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Job, in my opinion, in a very you know, soft moment of confronting her, says, you speak as the foolish woman speak. I probably would have said something different. And here's what he says. Shall we not receive, shall we receive only the good things from God and not the bad? 
And the word is actually this. Shall we, not receive, shall we receive only the good things from God and not the evil? See, God determines and allows trials to come our way for two main reasons. His glory and our eternal good. Is it the Genesis 3 world we live in? Does that cause it? Because we, we live in a world filled with sin? And the answer is yes, that happens. And because we're in a Genesis 3 world, we're going to have suffering in this world. Do we have a real enemy named Satan who wants to hurt us and divide the world? The answer is yes. But the sovereign overall is the one who determines whether suffering and trials are necessary for his children. Now, friends, this would be terrifying if your God were a tyrant, if he were evil, and if he was sadistic. If he was determined to do you harm for his own enjoyment, he would be a sick sovereign. But that is not our God. That is not our God. He is perfectly good, perfectly wise, and he is eternally powerful. And he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, and he is guarding us by his power, and he will not let us go because he is determined that it is necessary for us to go through this for a little while. Listen, if you believe that your God is eternally good and perfectly wise and eternally powerful, then you can put your trust in him with your trials just like you trust him with your secured salvation. He is not only guarding you, he is sustaining you. Do you believe your God is that good, that wise, and that eternally powerful that God can be the determiner if necessary that this is your trial? Do you trust that your God knows you best and knows the necessary trials for your life? For testing here is the word refining. See, we think of testing, we think of testing to see if something is real, if it's genuine. But that's not what he's talking about. Christians who love Jesus, even though they haven't believed in Jesus. You can see that in verses eight and nine of that text. He says, even though you haven't seen him, you love him. These are real, genuine Christians here. Refining seems to be better for Peter because it's the work of trials in our lives is like fire refining gold. Fire purifies gold. It doesn't, it doesn't test gold to see if it's gold. It, it's refining it to make gold more pure. It's taking the impurities off of it and out of it. Trials in life refine our faith. Do they test our faith? Yeah, they do. But more importantly, they are refining our faith. They make our faith more pure. Trials make our faith more faithful. Trials make us more dependent upon God. Trials reveal our weakness and God's strength. Trials put us face to face with our weakness and our our, uh, us being finite and force us to look up to heaven for help. But this comparison with our faith in gold goes even deeper. These folks would value gold immensely. It would be the most precious commodity in their world. And Peter says, your faith, which is refined by trials, is greater than gold refined by fire. Dear Christian, your faith in Jesus is more lasting, more precious than gold because gold perishes and your faith will not. It should tell you what you should be investing in, right? If you're investing just for your 401k and that's your eternal plan, then you've got a bad plan. You should be investing there for your future, but that's not where your eternal hope lies. Your faith more precious than gold. And you're, fa- and you're to have faith because God has caused you to be born again and he's guarding you by his eternal power. So do you see how Peter is connecting gospel to suffering? Now, there's a quote in your notes again by Edmund Clowney, and I want you to pay attention to this one. God sends trials to strengthen our trust in him so that our faith will not fail. Our trials keep us trusting. They burn away our self-confidence and drive us to our Savior. 
The fires of affliction or persecution will not reduce our faith to ashes. Fire does not destroy gold. No, it only removes combustible impurities. Yet even gold, e- even gold will, will last, what last vanish with the whole of this created order. Faith is infinitely more precious and more enduring. See, God uses our faith, uses trials to refine our faith. And notice what the refining is producing and accomplished. He says it will result in the praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus. See, the primary result of suffering is glory to Christ, honor to Christ. This is where suffering is not ultimately about us. See, we deal with suffering this way. We look internally. We see what happened to us and the pain it's causing us. God is looking at suffering from a completely different angle. Suffering is doing something in us to produce greater glory for Christ. That's why suffering is for God's glory and our eternal good. Now, I want you for a moment to imagine with me that you're on a ship that hits a storm. I mean, stuff is being tossed everywhere. You got all the you know, all the boxes being thrown everywhere. There's rooms getting flipped on end. You're clinging to your life and you're grabbing a hold of anything you can that is stable. The ship's captain comes over the loudspeaker and announces that everyone needs to hang on because the storm is going to get crazy. Things are going to be rough, but he says, I'm confident we will get the ship to shore safely, but it's going to be hard. When you arrive to shore, and you get off the boat, and you kiss the ground. Hear me closely. Your God has caused you to be born again to a living hope, and he is guarding you and sustaining you. Your king is alive, and he is well, and he is right with you right now. And trials, unlike anything else in your life, are revealing to you that God has his grip on you, and that's far greater than your grip on God. This allows us to receive good things from God and hard things from God, knowing that God is making our faith more pure and more sincere, and that will result in our eternal good and his great glory. The perfectly wise, perfectly good, and eternally powerful God loves you and knows you and is committed to the sincerity of your faith. Do you believe that? Do you believe he's committed to you that way? And this allows you to see your present sufferings as eternal benefits for you and for others. Listen, you need to be aware, everybody in the world is going to suffer. There's nobody left out. Elon Musk is going to suffer. You're going to suffer. The difference between you and everybody else in the world is we as Christians suffer with purpose. We suffer with hope. We suffer in such a way that brings praise and glory to Jesus. Is this how you're currently suffering? Suffering is a unique opportunity to demonstrate God, the gospel, and declare the gospel. This means it is okay to cry until you're dehydrated, with no answer or relief in sight. Yet trust, experience great loss knowing that your God is guarding you. It means you can feel real pain, real sorrow, real distress, but know in the one whom you have believed and be convinced that he is able to keep you and guard you until that day and he is refining you for his glory and your good. Do you believe that? Friends, God uses the furnace of this life to refine us and help us glorify Jesus in this life and the next. Let's pray together and our worship team will come up. As we pray this morning, more than likely, you are sitting next to someone who is suffering. There are several who have had bad health diagnoses in our church, several who are struggling with some new issue that's come up. And so, in your heart, would you think of them as you pray? Some of you right now are suffering, and I just want to pray for you. God, thank you that you have sent Jesus, our suffering servant, 
who has gone before us and who loves us, who cares for us. Thank you that Jesus is alive and so is our hope. Thank you that you have caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And we, your people, we come to you and we ask you to help our friends. I pray, Father, for those that are battling through all sorts of trials today. Would you strengthen them? Would you care for them? Would you sustain them? Would you help them to see your hand and sense your presence? Thank you that you are guarding them for a secured inheritance. God, thank you that you care today. And thank you that when Jesus came for us, he led the way as the one who went to suffering before us and he did it perfectly so that when we don't, we have a savior, an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit reminding us daily and momently that you are our father and we, your people, cling to you today. That's all we have. Lord, I pray for our non-Christian friends who are here. I just pray you'd help them see there is no living hope without Jesus. And open their eyes to the wonders of Christ. Father, we thank you today for meeting us. Thanks that you care for us. And thank you that you always be with us right to the end. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.